Serving spiritual seekers around the world. Unity Online Radio. Thank you for tuning in for this Unity Partner Program. Unity Online Radio partners with spiritual leaders from organizations whose mission and messages complement Unity's. We are pleased to bring you this program on Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world. Welcome to Living on Purpose with psychology doctoral candidate Jesse Harriet from Atlanta, Georgia. Are you ready to make the switch? A switch from barely living to living on purpose. During the next hour, you will discover principles to help you live a fully functioning, conscious, and purposeful life. The all is mind, and so are you. Let's live on purpose. Now, here's your host, Jesse Harriet. All right, folks, thanks again for tuning in to another week of Living on Purpose. Uh, my name is Jesse Herrett, and in this show, we are all about shifting out of uh, a life living on autopilot to becoming more fully engaged and present with the presence. In this hour, we'll be discussing consciousness. We'll be talking about uh, the Bible. We'll be talking about Christianity, religion, so you don't want to miss it on this exciting week as we are uh, – uh, moving uh, along all the way up until uh, April 8th, I believe that's when uh, Easter Sunday, yes, April 8th, uh, we're moving towards Easter Sunday, which is a very, very special time. And so without further ado, I just want to introduce to you all our special guest for this week who took the time out of his busy schedule to come and speak with us, uh, his eminence bishop, Sh- John Shelby Spong. His accolades would take an entire show to list. To some, he is the father of a progressive Christianity. To others, he's a champion of a liberal faith. To some, he's even a, a walking, talking, living prophet. Uh, he's a teaching bishop, and uh, the rest he will definitely address uh, in the hour as we have him on air. Bishop Spong, are you there? I'm here, Jesse. Thank you. Good to be with you. It's good to have you, Bishop. Um, thanks again for taking the time out of your schedule to come and impart your wisdom to us. Bishop, your works are so, so wonderful. I was just digging in um, as I was talking before um, we went on air to your book, Jesus for the Non-Religious, and you have so many out there. Uh, Bishop, I just want to jump right in, if you don't mind, because I have so many questions, and I want to dig out this information for our listeners. Um, I'm working my way slowly through your books, and I'm definitely having a blast. Um, And it's, you know what, Bishop, it's helping me to find a frame to put uh, my Christian upbringing, um, and I'm currently reading Jesus for the Non-Religious, so my first question uh, uh, from your standpoint and your years of scholarship, who was this figure that we call Jesus? Was he a historical figure? Is it mythological? How do we how do we deal with the figure called Jesus? How is he relevant to us? Well, I'm certain that he's historical. I'm also mm-hmm. certain that a great deal of mythology has been wrapped around him as we've tried to process the experience. But uh, you know this. If if Jesus didn't live, somebody exactly like him did, and he left mm-hmm. a, a visible footprint, an enormous impact, and uh, a lot of things have come out of that uh, that Jesus experience. What you've got when you get the Gospels, however, is narratives about Jesus written 40 to 70 years after his death. 40 mm-hmm. to 70 years, that's two to three generations, maybe even three and a half generations. The Gospels are written in Greek, a language Jesus did not speak, nor did his disciples speak. And so by the time you and I read the story of Jesus, he is it's 40 to 70 years, two to three generations past his time, in a world where there were, were no video cameras, there were no magazines, there was no daily newspaper. Everything had to, to be transmitted by word of mouth over that period of time. And it has to go through one translation, and there's no such thing as a perfect translation. So in the Gospels, we have an image. Behind, we have an image in the Gospels that is surely filled with interpretive process, some mythology, I'm quite sure. But behind that mythology and behind that interpretive process, there is a living and breathing and powerful 
uh, life-affirming uh, human being, that people found the presence of God alive in him. And, and so they began to try to interpret him. And when they do that, they do things like tell the story of the virgin birth. Virgin births were a dime a dozen in the, in the ancient Mediterranean world. Alexander mm-hmm. the Great was born of a virgin. Mithra was born of a virgin. Romulus and Remus was born of a virgin. Were born of a virgin. And that, that was a narrative by which ancient people began to try to say there was something about this life that human life alone could not have produced. So it has to come mm. from God. And so the virgin birth story doesn't enter the Christian faith until the ninth decade of the Christian era. It's certainly mm. not known in Paul, who wrote between 51 and 64. It's not known in Mark, who wrote in the early 70s. It's introduced by Matthew. It's repeated, but in a very different form in Luke. And then it disappears in John. It's not in John at all. John says on two occasions that Jesus is simply the son of Joseph. You can find mm-hmm. that in chapter 1 and in chapter 6 of John's Gospel. So that's when you begin to know that you're dealing with interpretive uh, framework, uh, mythological applications, but there is a figure behind those uh, applications that has to be engaged. Uh, you don't you don't begin to tell stories of somebody's miraculous birth unless there's a powerful experience that you've got to process. So I think you mm. you read the myths uh, symbolically and not as if it's fairy tales. Mm. So wow, that oh my God, that's a mouthful, <laughs> Bishop. Uh, how do we begin to interpret the Gospels symbolically? Um, our traditional fundamentalist uh, Christian upbringing, I'm, I'm sure you definitely know a lot about and have a lot of experience with dealing with those leaders, but they've always taught us to revere Jesus as the Son of God and also as God, but in so uh, doing, we've kind of sort of isolated ourselves. And even in my generation, you know, the younger generation, we still hear some of the same messages, those of us that are have come out of fundamentalist traditions. Now, within more liberal, progressive Christianity, metaphysics, new thought, unity, we don't hear that. You know, it's interpreted more symbolically, metaphysically, metaphorically. But for those that are listening that are probably still a part of those fundamentalist traditions, we're we're told, you know, that Jesus is, and we should revere Jesus and isolate ourselves. You know, where do we fit at in the picture? Well, it's uh, that's that's a good question, and it's difficult to get into that. Uh, once again, we need to recognize that you're dealing with an experience that was explained. Now, let me put some flesh on that. If you were to see an epileptic seizure in the first century. And if you were to see an epileptic seizure in the 21st century, what you would see would be identical. There's absolutely no Mm. clinical difference between a 1st century epileptic seizure and a 21st century epileptic seizure. However, Mm -hmm. if you were to read the explanation of what that 1st century person believed he was seeing, and then read an explanation of what somebody in the 21st century believed that he was seeing, the explanations would be so different you would hardly Uh, be aware that they were describing the same thing. Explanations are always time-bound and time-warped. They're always limited by the one who does the explaining. They always come through in a particular uh, language, and there's no such thing as an objective language. All languages are subjective and interpretive. And so what Mm -hmm. you've got is, is that what you need to do is to separate the Jesus experience from the explanations of the Jesus experience. There's no such thing as an eternal explanation. There is such a thing as an eternal experience. And part of the mm. problem that we have as Christian people today is that we've, we, have, we have had presented to us a literalized explanation of a first century phenomenon that makes very little sense. What they were trying to say about Jesus is that in the fullness of his humanity, they had engaged the fullness of what they believed was God. And then they tried to talk about that. How do you talk about that? Well, Paul, when Paul wrote, uh, when he wrote to the Corinthians about 54, he simply proclaimed it. He said God was in Christ. He didn't bother to explain how God got into Christ. He was just explaining, exclaiming mm-hmm. God was in Christ reconciling the world. By the time Paul wrote his epistle to the Romans, he was in an explanatory mood. That was about four years later. He'd never been to Rome. And so he wanted to explain what he was talking about to a Roman congregation that he had never met. And Mm -hmm. so he says in that that God declared Jesus to be the Son of God 
by the spirit of holiness at the time of the resurrection. Well, that's a very interesting idea. Uh, but that's Paul writing about 58. God declares Jesus to be the Son of God by the spirit of holiness at the time of the resurrection. That sort of assumes that he wasn't the Son of God until the resurrection, which mm. was a, an interesting idea that was later declared as heresy. By the time you get to Mark, who is the first gospel written between 70 and 72, uh, Mark presents Jesus as a fully adult male who comes to be baptized. And at his baptism, the heavens open and the Spirit of God is poured out upon him and he becomes a God-infused human life. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to Matthew, who's writing in the early years of the ninth decade, uh, the idea that Jesus became divine at the resurrection, which was what Paul was saying, didn't make a whole lot of sense to him. And that it, when Jesus came, became the Son of God at the time of the baptism didn't make a lot of sense to him. And so he says there never was a time when Jesus was not the Son of God, that he was the Son of God from the moment of conception. Mm. And that's when you get the virgin birth story. And as mm -hmm. I said, Matthew writes that first in the mid-'80s. Luke uh, adds his version of it, which is quite different, but it still uh, gives you the virgin birth idea. And then by the time you get to the 10th decade, when John is written, the idea that that Jesus could become divine even at a moment as early as conception didn't seem adequate. And so John writes this prologue and says that Jesus was of God from the very foundation of the universe. That is, when God mm. said, let there be light in the creation story, that was the first thing that existed other than God. That was the word of God that came out of God and was something besides God. And that is what Jesus is, they say. Jesus is the word of God that was in flesh. So even in the mm -hmm. New Testament, you have these wide explanations of how it was that the experience that people had with Jesus was a God experience. Now, behind every one of those explanations is the experience. Somehow, in some way, in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, people believed they had confronted the transcendent reality that they had called God. What I mm -hmm. think we've got to do is to get underneath the explanations and begin to try to find what the experience was, and then begin to be able to talk about that experience in the language of the 21st century. It will not be mm. eternal. That is, the 22nd century will have to put it into the language of the 22nd century. But our task mm -hmm. is to put the God experience into the language of the 21st century. And you can't do that if you literalize the scriptures, for example, which are first century explanations. They're beautiful, and I love them, mm -hmm. but you don't literalize them. Uh, and and that's just that's just the nature of doing the interpretive process. Oh my God, this is so beautiful, folks! If you have a pen and a pad, please, please, by all means, definitely take notes. We're listening to Bishop John Shelby Spong, and if you uh, are not able to take the notes, please go back and download this particular interview. Uh, you can download it for free from uh, w uh, www.unity.fm, and you definitely want to take detailed notes. Uh, this is very rich, uh, Bishop, uh, and and. Bishop Spong, uh, mythicists like Joseph Campbell and D.M. Murdoch also talk about the mythological aspects um, yeah. that you mentioned uh, previously. So, with all that being said, Bishop, uh, how do we um, how do we reinterpret it for this generation? What's the state of Christianity today and religion as a whole? Does does it have a future? Or because uh, what I'm finding now is it, it seems like you you run into folks, uh, regardless of the generation, that seem to be stuck. In, in a sense, between religions or stuck, you know, they're not even sure whether to even define themselves as Christian anymore because there are many seemingly Christianities, if you understand what I'm saying. Well, one of the reasons I'm so attracted to unity is that unity seems to me to cut beneath the literalism and to get to the experience. And in the process of cutting beneath the literalism, they open the Jesus experience up to all kinds of new dimensions. See, when, when the Jesus story was first talked about in the creeds under the influence of a man named St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, mm -hmm. they thought that, that human life began when God created a perfect man and a perfect woman and put them in a perfect garden called the Garden of Eden and that they walked with God every day in the cool of the evening. That was the, the mythological beginning. They didn't understand anything about evolution. They didn't know that we were were born into, that life appeared on this planet Earth somewhere about 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago, 
and it was a single cell, and it evolved through the centuries, through the hundreds of millions of years, into complexity, into a division between animals and plants, into the birth of consciousness in the animal side of, of that evolutionary life, and that mm. we emerged out of the sea between five and six hundred million years ago and began to take up our existence on the on the land, and that we were dominated by reptiles, and that the chief reptile was a dinosaur, and they ruled the planet Earth from about 185 million years ago to about 65 million years ago, and then some sort of accident happened, probably a meteor collided with the Earth and changed the climate and rendered the dinosaurs extinct and opened the door for the rise of mammals, and about 4 million years ago, out of the primate side of the mammal family, human-like creatures emerged, and finally, maybe no more than about 250,000 years ago, we crossed the boundary between being conscious life and became self-conscious life, and that's when human mm. beings emerged. That's where we've come from. There never mm. was a time when we were perfect. Now, mm -hmm. think about what that means. If there never was a time when you were perfect, then you could not fall from perfection. So the right. old idea of original sin is nonsense. You cannot fall from a perfection you never possessed. We are mm. evolving toward humanity. We did not fall away from perfection. And if you didn't fall away from perfection, then there's no need for you to be rescued by some external power. And so mm. the idea that Jesus comes out of, out of heaven, out of God, to rescue fallen sinners and restore us to something we've never been becomes a rather nonsensical way of telling the Jesus story. Now, so we have to go back and, and look at the thing from a whole different uh, perspective. Uh, what, is, what was it that the people saw in Jesus that made them think God was present in that life? Well, I think mm -hmm. what they saw was they saw a human life that was not survival-oriented, a life that was free to give his love away, give his, give his life away, not to hate even those people who were taking his life from him, and and when a life is free beyond all of its survival mentalities, then you discover that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. There's neither mm -hmm. Israeli nor Palestinian. There's neither Protestant nor Catholic. There's neither Sunni nor Shia. That all of those are human divisions which we in our survival-oriented phase have built up to try to protect ourselves so that we become the winners but when, when you understand that the Christ experience is the gift of life that lifts you beyond all of your fears and even the need to survive and frees you to give your life away, then you understand why they thought somehow God was present in the life of this Jesus. Jesus invited them to a new level of consciousness. Uh, mm. He invited them into a new understanding of what it means to live and to love and to be. And God was perceived as the source of life worshipped when they learned to live, the source of love, worshipped when they learned to love, the ground of being, worshipped when they had the courage to be everything that they were to be. And the task of the Christian is not to go out and convert people so they'll all look like me and act like me and worship like me. The task right. of the Christian church is to go out and give people the fullness of life, the capacity to love, the courage to be, so that they can then give those humanizing gifts to everybody else. And, and that's why the fourth gospel can say things like, or have Jesus say things like, my purpose is that you might have life and have it abundantly. You give mm. people life by loving them into the courage to be all that they can be and delivering them from the mentality that everybody that doesn't look like them or act like them is somehow their enemy and they've got to be mm -hmm. protected from them. And that's where, that's where the divisions in the human family come from. Bishop, that is beautiful. And on that note, folks, I know we're ending on a cliffhanger. We have to take a commercial break. I'm Jesse Herrett talking today with Bishop Shelby Spong. Uh, we'll continue the conversation with Bishop Spong right here at unity.fm. Stay tuned. Unity Online Radio is bringing the message of unity to tens of thousands of spiritual seekers around the world. If you have been served by this programming, we invite you to support it by visiting www.unity.fm and clicking on Donate Now. Thank you for your support.
Hi, my name is Lynn Twist. I'm the author of The Soul of Money. If you're struggling right now with a financial crisis, I recommend going to www.unityfm and listening to our course about the soul of money and how to handle this in a way that brings out the deep spirituality that's available at this time. You know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Join author Lynn Twist for the blessing of the financial crisis. You'll learn new techniques to use the current economic situation to redefine your relationship with money. It's available now for immediate download at unity.fm in the video download section. Ever have those days when you think life isn't all that you thought it could be? Well, it's our thinking that creates the canvas of our life's masterpiece. When we are ready and willing to step into a new way of thinking, our world literally begins to shift and grow into something bigger and brighter than we ever imagined. Hi, I'm Jamie Sanders, host of Spirituality Today here on the Unity Online Radio Network. Be sure to join us every Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern to hear in-depth conversations with leading teachers, authors, and musicians in the world of spirituality and new thought. Listen in and open up Spirituality Today, where life keeps getting better and better. You've been listening to Living on Purpose with Jesse Harriet. If you have a question or comment about today's broadcast, or if you'd like to join in the discussion, friend us on Facebook at Jesse Harriet, or email us at livingonpurpose at unity.fm. Now, more Living on Purpose. Thank you, folks, for tuning in today with uh, us here at Living on Purpose at unity.fm. We're talking today with Bishop John Shelby Spong. Again, I'm Jesse Harriet. Uh, Bishop, um, while we were talking over the break, uh, could you reiterate for our audience, I was just letting you know that I have never heard evolution explained like that. You know, and I was saying that we must have, as, as some of the writers, Phil Moore and Ernest Holmes, talked about the whole of creation contained within our being if we evolved from a single-celled organism. That's correct, and and that's, again, why unity offers an alternative to the old literalistic uh, point of view. We discovered DNA within the last 50 years, and what DNA does is that it it enables us to see that all living things are related. We're all part of one unfolding whole. You and I have DNA connections, not just with the great apes. Uh, Those are clear. That's about a 99% identical DNA. But we're also kin to the cabbages, and we're kin to the plankton of the sea. We're kin to the insects. All life is part of this unfolding whole, and human beings are the self-conscious part of life. Now, that means that as self-conscious people, we, we are organized within ourselves in a way that no other creature is. And so we can reach beyond our limits. That's why we are worshiping animals. We're the only animal, so far as we know, that is able to worship because we can commune with what we, with who we believe is the source of life. Mm. And so we don't go through life just sort of eating and, and uh, growing and reproducing and dying and eating and being born and eating and growing and reproducing and dying in an endless uh, span like insects and like sheep. We can contemplate the meaning of life. We can raise questions about the meaning of life. We can, we can meditate on what the source of life is that we call God. We can mm. understand the power of love that enhances life. Everybody knows that that's what, what happens. When a baby's born, that baby's more like a sponge than it is a, a responsive creature, but you love mm-hmm. that baby into the capacity to love. And so as mm-hmm. love is poured into that baby, that baby begins to be able to give love away. And so we become life-giving people to one another. And that's part of what I think the God presence in all of us is. And that's the God presence I think people saw in Jesus of Nazareth. They didn't Mm -hmm. know how to process it in the language of today. But you shouldn't expect that. Uh, if, If the Jesus experience happened in the 21st century, we would process that experience with very different language from what the first century did. But that doesn't mean that the experience is either more true or less true. It's just that our way of explaining it is quite different. 
Wow, that's amazing. So we uh, we have the freedom, especially in Unity and New Thought. They teach this, but we have the freedom because fundamentalists uh, regard the sixty six books as the Word of God, and whatever yeah, it says in the never eighth, read them. you can't yeah. regard the sixty six <laughs> books as the Word of God if you've read them. I mean, those books right. say. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says, for example, that if a child disobeys his or her parent and talks back to them, they should be put to death. How many right. people think that's the word of God? Right. Uh, it says that if you're a homosexual, you should be put to death. It says if you worship a false god, you shall be put to death. It, it talks about how the Jews wouldn't be, they had just been defeated by the Babylonians, and one of the Psalms says that the Jews aren't going to be happy until they take the children of the Babylonians and dash their heads against the rocks. You don't want to read that in church and say, this is the word of the Lord. It's only those people who have never read the Bible that make these strange claims. What we do say about the Bible is that we hear the word of God speaking in the words of Scripture. But that's very Uh different. The words themselves are not the word of God. Wow, that's amazing. And you know what? It liberates us to be able to jump back into that book because some that's individuals correct. haven't that I've spoken to and that I meet yep. from time to time, they haven't read their Bible in years because well, they, you know, you, know, it, you uh, don't want to read it. It says it says such terrible things. In right. Samuel, in the book of Samuel, it has God favoring genocide. Uh, the prophet mm. Samuel tells King Saul to go out to war against the Amalekites and to kill every man, every woman, every child, every suckling, every ox and every ass among the the Amalekites, that's genocide. You don't want to put God on the side of genocide. But mm. you do also see in that book that, that our understanding of God is growing. Uh, God begins in the Bible as a sort of tribal deity, uh, and tribal deities all have a, a chosen people, that is, the people of the tribe who make that God their God. And the mm. tribal God always hates everybody the chosen people hate, so that God is portrayed right. as sending terrible plagues on the Egyptians and drowning them in the Red Sea and rejoicing over their deaths. It's not very easy to worship that God if you happen to be an Egyptian. But mm-hmm. see, we don't look at the Bible from an Egyptian point of view. But what, mm-hmm. what happens is that the, this concept of God goes through a lot of experiences. And when you get to the prophets... You get to Hosea, and God gets transformed into love. You get to Amos, and God gets transformed into justice. You get Mm. to Jonah, and God says that you cannot bind anybody with your own prejudices. Mm -hmm. And you get to Malachi, and the last book of the Old Testament, and Malachi says God is universal. It's not just a tribal God. Malachi says, from the rising of the sun to its setting, God's name shall be great among the Gentiles. That was a revolutionary statement. Mm-hmm. And in every nation, incense shall be offered unto my name. So you you see this understanding, the human understanding of God grows. And when you get to the Gospels, you see Jesus saying, folks, you've, if you don't, you're not going to understand God until you begin to love your enemies. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a whole new dimension. Right. Say to, say to Jewish so- people, you're not going to understand God unless you learn to love the Nazis who exterminated six million Jews. Say to people mm. who lost their their loved ones in the 9-11 attack that you're not really going to understand the meaning of God until you're able to love Osama bin Laden. That mm. is when you begin to know this story is a powerful story. And yeah. the human beings, it's easy to hate. It's not easy right. to love. It's right. easy to blame. It's not easy to forgive. And it's certainly not easy to forgive your enemies or to love your enemies, and yet that's where the story finally drives us. Wow, this is amazing, folks. Please, please take this information in. Bishop, uh, I'm taking a direct quote from one of your uh, lectures. I mean, your lectures are phenomenal, and and thank God that they are viral. You can catch them on YouTube and probably contact some of the direct sources to get the actual DVDs, but one of your quotes from your lecture on Beyond Theism, and I quote, God is the presence at the source of life. It lives in you and me. It lives in all of us. If this is true, the only way that we can worship this presence is by living. Now, this is good stuff. Can you unpack that for our listeners? Yeah, I think that's exactly I think that's exactly correct. I can't tell you who God is or what God is, mm-hmm. neither can anybody else. The Pope can't right. do that. Jerry Falwell can't do that. The Ayatollah Khomeini can't do that. There's no human being that can tell another human being who God is. Mm-hmm. We can tell other human beings how we believe we experience God, because that's wow. something that we possess. But that's not mm-hmm. who God is. That's my experience of God. And we need to face the fact that we might be delusional. I've met a lot of people who thought they were God, 
and uh, <laughs> some of them are very, very strange, and some of them are in mental hospitals. And if mm-hmm. you've got uh, if you've got a person in a mental hospital who thinks that he is God and he tells you to go to hell, he really means it. I mean, it's pretty literal <laughs> in his mind. But uh, that's our our reality is that we experience God. Now that's all we can go. And I can say mm-hmm. I believe I experience God as a source of life. And if mm-hmm. God is a source of life, the only way I can worship God is by living, by living fully. And I believe I experience God as a source of love. And if God is a source of love, the only way I can worship God is by loving, by loving right. wastefully. And I believe I experience God as the ground of being. And if God yes. is the ground of being, the only way I can worship God is by having the courage to be everything that I can be. And when, I, when I'm able to live fully and love wastefully and be all that I can be, then I recognize that I am part of who God is because God mm-hmm. is love. That's very biblical. And, mm-hmm. and then you begin to know that the way you give God away is by giving life and love and being away, by helping people mm-hmm. live more fully and love more wastefully and become everything that they can be. And the reason that I'm a Christian and the reason that I see God present in the life of Jesus is that when I look at this Jesus, I see one who lived fully. I see one mm-hmm. who loved beyond every human boundary. You know, no matter what people did to him, he responded by loving them. You know, they denied him and he loved them. They betrayed him and he loved them. They forsook him and he loved them. They tortured him and he loved them. They killed him and he loved them. The Mm. Jesus story is is God saying, there's nothing you can ever do and nothing you can ever be that will place you outside the boundaries of the love of God. And when Mm -hmm. you embrace that reality then you're free to live and free to love and free to be. And that's what the Christian faith is all about. That's one of the Mm -hmm. things that I think unity sees more clearly than most denominations. Exactly. And and I think that's why uh, whatever unity's emphasis is will be part of what I think the Christianity of the 21st century will evolve into being. And that's why I'm so uh, appreciative of of the ministry of of unity and and of its understanding of of the meaning of life. Mhm. This is amazing, Bishop. This is amazing. You mentioned uh uh that we should dare to be all that we can be since God is the ground of all being. Uh, uh what helped you in your journey, Bishop, to discover this essence of being and to, you know, discover your purpose because many of us we go through and we we're, we you know go to school and we're educated and we go and get jobs but a lot of folks are uh matriculating out of you know these jobs and, and different places of employment uh, because th- they're having a identity crisis so, so to speak they're trying to um, um find their purpose and find their life calling and discover what it is that they were born to do um and i found out that if you can tap into that or connect with that uh, you're a lot more happier, you know? Uh, what yeah. helped you to discover... Well, you're not ever going to be defined by your job. You're not ever right. going to be defined by your relationships. Your definition's got to be within yourself. But, Jesse, mm-hmm. I was born in, in the fundamentalist South. I grew up in a very evangelical Episcopal church that taught me that uh, segregation was the will of God and quoted the Bible to prove it. It taught me that men were superior to women by their very nature and quoted the mm. Bible to prove it. They taught me it was okay for me to hate other religions, and especially the Jews, and quoted the Bible to prove it. And they taught me that homosexuals were either mentally sick or morally depraved. And if they were mentally sick, they ought to be cured, and if they were morally depraved, they ought to be converted. And, of mm-hmm. course, they quoted the Bible to prove that. And none of those things do I agree with today, but that's where I came from. And as I began to explore the Jesus story... I began to see that there was something a whole lot more to this Christian faith than than these prejudices of my childhood. And I began to work past those one by one. They were not easy, and it makes you very controversial. Uh, You know, of course, people love their sicknesses. They love their sweet prejudices, and they hide themselves underneath them uh, because we're all fearful human beings. We're all survival-driven human beings, and we don't like people that are different from us. And that's where all of our prejudices come from. And what happens when you get into the Jesus story underneath the literal level is that you begin to confront the power of life, the power of love, the ground of being, and it calls you to a whole new understanding of what it means to be to be human. I don't believe that divine and human are two different categories. 
I believe they're on a spectrum. I believe the way you become divine is to become completely and fully human. And that's when your life becomes open so that the, div that the divine can live in you and work through you. And I think that's the secret to Jesus of Nazareth. I see him as the fully human one. And in the fullness of his humanity, he became a perfect channel for the fullness of God to enter into dialogue with human beings. And that makes a whole lot more sense to me than to tell the story of God being his father by the virgin birth. Uh, that's, a, that's an attempt to say the same thing, but it's in language that I don't believe the 21st century is going to embrace. Remember, in the first century, they didn't know that women had an egg cell. They had no concept mm -hmm. of that. They thought the whole life of the new person was lived in the sperm of the male, and the male simply planted it in the womb of the female like the farmer planted the seed in the soil of Mother Earth. And all the female did was to nurture the man's seed. All the Mother Earth did was to nurture the farmer's seed. And we didn't understand mm -hmm. that women had an egg cell until about 1724 when it was discovered. And then we had mm -hmm. to begin to see that women are co-creators of life. You can't discriminate against someone who's a co-creator of life. We right. began to understand that humanity comes in different races. You can't discriminate against humanity because they, they're a different ethnic background from your own. And we now have learned, and in, in mostly in the 20th century, that homosexuality is not something anybody chooses to do or to be. It's something people right. awaken to. It's a minority aspect in the family of human beings, it's even it's even a minority aspect in the higher mammals. We can document homosexual behavior in the higher mammals just like we can in, in human life. So you don't want to spend your time building yourself up by tearing somebody else down, whether it's on the basis right. of race or sex or, or sexual orientation or, or anything else. Uh, those are Those are the aspects of a humanity that doesn't know the fullness of God. So if mm -hmm. we can help people become fully human, then they become open to what it means to be fully divine. And I think these two things begin to come together. Oh, and I that's think that's what the fourth gospel is all about. That's when Jesus says, the Father and I are one. If you've seen me, you've seen God. He didn't mean that God had come into Jesus to masquerade as a human being so that mm -hmm. Jesus is to God what Clark Kent is to Superman. It meant that in the life of this human Jesus, God was experienced as constantly coming and fulfilling life. And I think that's a powerful image. And if we can yes. recover that, I think we can recover the Christian faith for the 21st century. Oh, my God. This is, this is amazing, Bishop. Uh, folks, please, please, I, I hope you are definitely paying attention. Uh, this is very rich stuff. Bishop, this stuff is so rich, I'm almost running out of questions. <laughs> it also might give you indigestion. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all in the books. Know. Uh, you know, I, the books that I write, are. this is the theme, and I look at various aspects of the Christian story through all of the books. Most of what we're talking about this morning comes right out of Jesus for the non-religious. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and folks, uh, you would be amiss if you don't uh, purchase these books for your library. Uh, this is uh, scholarly information. It's insightful, and it will, as you put it, Bishop, help you to become more fully human. So we have to go uh, to a commercial break soon, but really quickly, can we uh, talk a bit about our, our humanity? So the goal isn't to, in a sense, escape our humanity and become super spiritual. Uh, That's right. Our goal is to become fully human, and therefore mm -hmm. to be open to the divine. That's a very different concept. Very different. Folks, I'm talking today with Bishop John Shelby Spong, best-selling author, theologian, lecturer, and champion of inclusive faith. When we return, we'll continue the conversation with Bishop Spong right here at Unity.fm. Stay tuned. Today, I stand firmly in my faith. I meet life courageously and confidently, seeing beyond appearances to underlying good. Through faith, I overcome every limitation. I know that God's power within me is greater than any situation I may have to meet or overcome. God is greater than any condition or circumstance. Through faith, I am fearless and free. This inspirational message is brought to you by Daily Word. Daily Word. Inspiration and practical teachings to help people of all faiths 
live healthy, prosperous, and meaningful lives. Give daily word to yourself or a friend and give the gift of hope, joy, peace, and encouragement. Order your subscriptions today online at dailyword.com. Are you ready for the next steps on your spiritual path? If you are, you won't want to miss the Yoga Hour, Living the Eternal Way, with Rev. Ellen Grace O'Brien from the Center for Spiritual Enlightenment in San Jose, California. Essential insights and practices from the ancient yoga science of self-realization show us how to live healthier, happier, more balanced lives. The benefits of spiritually conscious living start now. For a time-tested method to live with purpose and realize your infinite potential, tune in to The Yoga Hour, Living the Eternal Way, with Rev. Ellen Grace O'Brien, every Thursday morning at 10 Central, 8 a.m. Pacific, only on Unity FM, the voice of an awakening world. been listening to Living on Purpose, where psychology meets spirituality. Now, here is your host, Jesse Harriet. Thank you, folks, for tuning in today. We're talking today with Bishop John Shelby Spong, theologian, teaching bishop, and best-selling author. Uh, bishop, to continue the conversation, uh, where are we going as a species, uh, where are we evolving to? Right now, we are, um, as you put it, correct me if I mispronounced the, uh, the quote, but we're self-conscious beings. We can think about our thoughts. Uh, where are we evolving to? Where do you see our evolution taking us next? Well, it's always very speculative because I don't know how you can project the future. But as I look at the patterns of evolution, it seems to mm-hmm. me that we've gone from primitive consciousness to consciousness, to self-consciousness, and the next step seems to me to be that we go into a universal consciousness. And that's Mm. when we become aware that God is a part of who we are, and we are a part of who God is, and that there is no real separation between the human and the divine. But that's that's a step beyond where we are right now. But that might exactly be what was going on in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's why people Mm -hmm. saw him as so unusual that they had to to build all these myths around him to try to explain how that presence and how that power got into him. Uh, I think if if we evolve enough, and if we don't destroy ourselves, either by destroying our climate or by overbreeding or all of the other, or by going to some atomic war, uh, and mm-hmm. there's always a possibility that we will destroy ourselves. But I think if we're allowed to continue the development of our humanity, uh, we will bind together Eastern religion and Western religion. Eastern right. religion sees God as the all and sort of de-emphasizes the individual. And Western religion mm-hmm. always seen the importance of the individual in relation to God. And I think the way that we'll finally put this together is that we will all be individualized inside the universal consciousness that we will call God, and East mm. and West will come together. But that's highly speculative, and that's not going to happen in my lifetime or even yours, young as you are, mm-hmm. Jesse. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, we're talking about eons of time. The dinosaurs ruled this planet Earth between 185 million and 65 million years ago. They mm-hmm. probably had no idea that there would ever come a time when they would not be dominant. You know, mm-hmm. And then out of the blue, probably, and we only speculate about this, but out of the blue, it seems that a media, maybe the size of the planet Mars, collided with the Earth and changed our weather patterns and maybe created a cloud of dust that lasted for two or three generations. And it rendered these huge forms of reptile life uh, extinct. The dinosaurs disappeared, and we all understand that. Uh, but it opened the door for new forms of life to develop, and the new forms of life happened to be mammals, and they had a higher potential and higher brain possibilities, and so it made human life possible. Uh, mm-hmm. But that was, I don't know what the future for the human race is. I, I think there's always a battle between becoming uh, more fully conscious and killing each other. I think that's where, we, that's where the battle mm-hmm. is today. 
and I don't, I don't know. I think it's a race. I don't know which will win out. Uh, we we keep adding a billion people to the population of the world every 35, 40 years. You can't do that and expect the resources of the world to continue to be able to provide for population like that. We're the only, we don't have any natural enemies anymore except ourselves. And, right. Uh, you know that. So we kill each other with with glee in all sorts of wars. There's a war going on somewhere in the world all the time. Right mm-hmm. now, over in the Sudan, you'll find war, very hot war going on. It's a threatened war right now between uh, Israel and, and Iran. And there's war going on in Afghanistan and between the Pakistan and the Afghanistan border. And a lot of these wars are religiously fueled. And as we play right. the game, my God is better than your God, so I think I'll kill you. That didn't make mm-hmm. a lot of sense. But that's the sort of game we human beings play. So I don't know what the future will be. I think we've got to stop human breeding, overbreeding. I think we've got to clean up our environment. I don't see any will to do that. I don't see any political will to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. We've just gone through, and I don't know how Atlanta's been, but this year we had one snow in October. We haven't had snow mm-hmm. in New York since October. Mm. And it's just lovely here. But yeah, here too. You know, we usually have 50 to 60 inches of snow. Now, where's that all gone? Uh, the yeah. climate is changing around this world, and I think part of it is that we continue to pour fossil fuels into the atmosphere, and we're experiencing global warming. But, of course, warming in some places has mean global cooling in other places. If you go over to the mm-hmm. Ukraine, they had about 25 days of, of temperature below zero. Uh, wow. you know, we were sweltering here during the summer, during the winter, but they were freezing. So you're going to have these shifts in Popular in uh, climate, and I think that that's because human beings uh, don't much think beyond the boundaries of tomorrow. Or if you're a politician, right. you don't think beyond the boundary of the next election. And you're not going to mm-hmm. solve global warming uh, on a two-year, four-year, or even six-year Senate term. It's got to be a long-range mm-hmm. plan, and the whole world's got to participate in it. That's not going to be easy. And getting right. birth control and family planning... We're watching a political campaign where the, some candidates even campaigning against contraception. I think wow. that's to campaign against morality. I think it's mm-hmm. moral to limit our population and to plan our families. I think it's immoral not to. But that's mm-hmm. not what's coming out in this political campaign. So until you get a will, a political will, to solve the problems that face the human race, I don't think anybody can predict what the future is going to be. Mm. This is powerful stuff, powerful stuff. So, Bishop, what is our part? What are some practices that we can implement to um, – I'm not even sure how to word this, but what can we do to participate in this uh, evolutionary process that's taking place and not, in a sense, uh, be a blockage to try and prevent it? Because we know we can't stop it. But I wish, I could, I wish I could of? answer that. Uh, I don't know that anybody can answer that. I think, you know, we don't have the power to do much more than to guard uh, uh, our own way of life. And I think if we would begin to simplify our individual way of life, it might help. But if everybody doesn't do it, it's not going to help. So mm-hmm. how do you go about getting the whole world to get a new vision of what it means to to simplify life? If the Chinese mm-hmm. and the Indian population want as many electrical appliances and automobiles as we have in the United States... And there's no mm-hmm. reason why they shouldn't want these things. I mean, we've got them. Why would they not want them? Mm-hmm. Uh, but if they get them, you know, you gotta, you're talking about a, an oil shortage and you're talking about a pollution crisis that the likes of which we've never seen. There are mm-hmm. 1.3 billion people in China. Suppose they all had one car apiece like most everybody in the United States seems to have. Now, mm-hmm. where's, the, where's the oil going to come from to power those cars? And what's going to mm-hmm. happen to the atmosphere that where those cars pour their exhaust out into the atmosphere every day. Now, that's, those are the problems, and they're huge problems, and I don't, see, I don't see either of our political parties able to address those problems. And I don't think if either of them ever did, they'd be reelected. You know, I mm. think that's the reality. <laughs> so what's right. going to happen probably is that we will have some ecological disaster in which millions mm-hmm. of people will be killed. And then we will suddenly realize that if we don't learn to work together and to uh, have, develop a kind of life that can be sustained on this planet, which is going to require sacrifices for everybody, then we're, none mm-hmm. of us are going to survive. And only mm-hmm. when that choice is stark and before us do I believe we'll begin to curtail 
some of the excesses of our of our human profligacy and mm. uh, and begin to work together i we've got to get to a place where we are mutually responsible and interdependent with one another right. all over this world and that's a long way away and right now we can't even get Catholics and Protestants to love each other in Ireland, or Sunnis and Shias to love each other in Iraq. How are we mm-hmm. going to get the whole world's population to begin to work together for the survival of us all? I don't know that I see any way that it's going to happen, short of mm-hmm. some disaster that will drive us to recognize that. Mm-hmm. And I don't we want have a disaster, but uh, I don't right. see the will to do it. So I'm mm-hmm. a pessimist about the future. I'm an optimist about the future of Christianity. I'm a pessimist about the future of our world. Mm, yes, so we have some we have some work to do. We have a responsibility. Bishop, it's funny that you mentioned um, excess, and then you mentioned the word simplicity in one of your responses, because when you look at society, you see everything is, is, is excess. It's hypersexualized. It's hypersensualized. It's hypermaterialized. And even sometimes people in religion and, and new thought and metaphysics, they, they're always manifesting materiality because we can buy into that hype sometimes too um, oh, every, every, it happens all the time everybody does it mm-hmm. it's awfully yeah. hard to escape your survival mentality uh, and yet I think our humanity will not ever be enhanced until we escape our survival mentality and learn how to live for other people the only only way I really understand that Jesse is mm-hmm. to tell people to think about the time when they fell in love Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, they loved somebody else more than they loved themselves, wow. and they wanted the 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 well being of the beloved more than they wanted the well being of themselves. They wanted the happiness of the beloved more than they wanted the happiness of themselves, and that gives us the sense that they, we can escape our self centeredness and live for yes. somebody else, and we can do it for the people we most love. But right. I think what we see in the Christ figure is that He does that for the whole world. That, that is, he does mm. that for the least of these, his brothers and sisters. He does that for the Samaritans and the Gentiles and and all the people that were discriminated against. So I think we see in him a sense of what it means to be human and therefore mm-hmm. a sense of what it means to have God flow through the human and into the into the wider world. And mm. that's, the, so that's a mystical approach, and you, and, but it still means it's a very powerful concept for me. That I can be mm. part of who the life of God is, and the life of God can be part of who I am, and that we're not separate one from another. God is not above the sky somewhere, keeping record books up to date. God is in the life I live, the love I share, the being I am, and when I give life and love and being away to another person, what I'm really doing is giving God away to the other person. Mm. And that's the God I see in the figure of Jesus. Yeah, so in one word, if we could sum it all up, love is the key or the catalyst that will help us to uh, demonstrate some of the same principles that the Christ person and Christ principle demonstrated. That's correct, and that's even biblical. The first epistle Mm. of St. John says, God is love, and if you do not abide in love, you cannot abide in God. Uh, That's just just the reality. I think we ought to say both, both sides of that. God is love, and I think love is also God. And that's when we put the thing together. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Bishop, for your time. We're all out of time. Pleasure to be with you. Yes, sir. Best wishes to you you and your career. Thank you for imparting your wisdom to us. Uh, Bishop Spong's latest book, Reclaiming the Bible for a Non-Religious World, is available in bookstores worldwide and online where books are sold. You can follow Bishop Spong online via Facebook or directly at uh, johnshelbyspong.com. Thank you so much for tuning in this week to Living on Purpose at Unity.fm Radio, the voice for an awakening world. And just remember, this program is made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. Thanks for joining us again. This has been Jesse Herod encouraging you to live on purpose. Thank you for tuning in to Living on Purpose, where psychology meets spirituality with Jesse Harriet. Listen in live every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Central Time for more insights into psychology, ancient wisdom, and how it connects to your life today. Living on Purpose, only on Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world. This program is brought to you in part by www.jesseharriet.com, where psychology meets spirituality. Connect with us on Facebook and YouTube. Keyword search, Jesse Harriet. Om 
Warning. After listening to the Oneness Program, Fridays at 11 a.m. Central on Unity Online Radio, people have reported feeling a profound stillness in body and mind that continues well into the weekend. Others have found that their internal quiet is matched by a flow and ease in relationships and daily activities. Join Rev. Dr. Patricia Keel for the Oneness Program and experience the Oneness Blessing. Friday mornings, 11 a.m. Central Time, on Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world. In quiet moments of prayer, let go of any concern. Anchor your trust deep in the realization that with God all things are possible. Never doubt it for a single moment. This meditative moment is brought to you by Unity. Ever have those days when you think life isn't all that you thought it could be? Well, it's our thinking that creates the canvas of our life's masterpiece. When we are ready and willing to step into a new way of thinking, our world literally begins to shift and grow into something bigger and brighter than we ever imagined. Hi, I'm Jamie Sanders, host of Spirituality Today here on the Unity Online Radio Network. Be sure to join us every Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern to hear in-depth conversations with leading teachers, authors, and musicians in the world of spirituality and new thought. Listen in and open up Spirituality Today, where life keeps getting better and better. Warning. After listening to the Oneness Program, Fridays at 11 a.m. Central on Unity Online Radio, people have reported feeling a profound stillness in body and mind that continues well into the weekend. Others have found that their internal quiet is matched by a flow and ease in relationships and daily activities. Join Rev. Dr. Patricia Keel for the Oneness Program and experience the Oneness Blessing. Friday mornings, 11 a.m. Central Time, on Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world. Have you ever considered that everything you think and say is a prayer to the universe? Are you sending a positive or negative message? Join Rev. Beverly Molander and her guest on Affirmative Prayer, Activating the Power of Yes, to find out how you can activate your own power of yes. Using affirmative prayer, or positive intention, can make a big difference in the way you think, feel, and live. If you want help moving from chaos to clarity in relationships, health, prosperity, or work, this is the place for you. We'll have some how-to suggestions about how you can say yes more often from this point forward. Talk with Beverly Molander and her guest live every Monday at noon central or 1 p.m. Eastern. Affirmative prayer, activating the power of yes. Only on Unity Online Radio, the voice of an awakening world. <laughs> 